Stanford University. On August 10, 2009, a massive truck bomb went off in the Iraqi village of Shinjar, inhabited by the Shabak minority group. Three days later, another bomb went off in a Yazidi town of Sinjar, killing 21 people. I think we've all grown a little bit blasé about bombings in Iraq. They're occurring all the time. It's practically daily news. I think, however, that these two attacks should be taken much more seriously uh, because they are part of what some observers have referred to as a genocide against the minority groups of Iraq. We hear very little about this. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we can discuss some of the reasons why we're, talking, we're not talking about uh, this situation. Uh, what's important to understand, though, is that a group like the Shabak are always referred to in the U.S. repressed as tiny. You can see if you do a web search of Shabak uh, and tiny, you get 21,000 hits. And almost all the newspaper reports refer to this as the tiny Shabak community, or the tiny uh, ethnic group. Actually, the Shabaks are not tiny by most uh, definitions of the word, 60,000 according to the Wikipedia where the Shabak themselves claim that they have four to 500,000, which is actually a, a small remnant of what they claim was much um, a population of over two million not so long ago. The other attack was against the Yazidi population, which numbers somewhere between 350 and 600,000, according to the Wikipedia. Of course, we really have no idea how many people belong to either of these groups. What we need to understand is that the conflict in Iraq goes well beyond the th normal threefold division of the Sunni Arabs, the Shiite Arabs, and the Kurds, which is how it's usually uh, depicted. Actually, there are at least 10 other minority groups uh, in the country, some of which are quite tiny. There are very few Jews left in Iraq, although in the 1940s there were several hundred thousand. But some of these other groups, the Shabaks, the Yazidis, the Turkmen's, uh, number in the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands. And the conflict between uh, Kurds, Sunni Arabs, and Shiite Arabs is putting these minority populations in a very precarious position, uh, a position that could indeed lead to what some have described as a genocide. Let me just show the picture here uh, in these areas by giving you some Google Earth images. So here's a Google Earth uh, image of northern Iraq. You can see the neighbors, and I've highlighted here uh, Nineveh or Nineveh Governorate which is the site of both of these attacks and a part of Iraq that has some of the most complex uh, ethnic divisions. In the eastern part of Nineveh prefecture, we have the city of Mosul, the third largest city in Iraq, which has been probably the most violent city uh, in recent years. In this Google Earth image, you can see the mountains of uh, Kurdistan to the north, uh, somewhat uh, forested, relatively heavy rainfall for Iraq. And then as we go south, we go into the sort of a, a drier or semi-arid plains where you have rain-fed agriculture. Here you can see the city of Mosul right next to the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh, uh, where you can find the Assyrian ruins, and the Nineveh plains just north. And the Nineveh plains are an area of rain-fed agriculture, cropping in the wintertime, with a number of densely aggregated village communities. And uh, Kazna was one of these villages which was recently attacked. Uh, the Shabak people in Kazna have their uh, own distinctive language, Shabaki it's often called. It's in the Iranian language family, and it's actually uh, distantly related to Kurdish, but much more closely related to a language called Gurani, uh, as well as another one's called Zaza, which you can see it on this map. Uh, and I added to the map the small Shabaki area. So they're distinctive in terms of language, and they're also distinctive in terms of religion, although it depends on who you talk to, uh, the source of information. The Shabak news actually tells us that they're divided between Shiites and Sunnis, just like uh, most others in Iraq are, and that's that. When you start digging down, though, you find that the Shabaks are anything but Orthodox Muslims, or at least most of them are not. Uh, according to the Wikipedia, you can see that a large number follow an independent religion distinct from Islam, which is, has close affinity to the Yazidis, the other uh, attack victims who I'll talk about later. Shabaks actually perform pilgrimages to Yazidi shrines. They have their own sacred book, interestingly enough, not written in their own language, but in the language of their neighbors, the Turkmen. Uh, and it is a syncretic or, or a complex religious system. Uh, like I say, very un-Islamic in many ways. They have no problem with alcohol. They view the Quran as something that should be taken metaphorically. Uh, what we find as we, uh, as we look into these issues is this is 
far from unique. It says here in the Wikipedia article that the beliefs of the Yarsan are similar. Well, the, the Yarsan are a religious group concentrated in Iran who may number uh, up to a million. So these are anything but a small or inconsiderable uh, religious beliefs. Now, if we go to the other side of the attack, uh, the Yazidi village of Sinjar, uh, we can see this is to the west of Mosul, uh, not far from the Syrian border. You can see Sinjar Mountain, and just south of that, the city of Sinjar, a city of about 8,000 uh, people. You can see some irrigated agriculture. It's a relatively isolated area, and it is the main uh, population concentration of the Yazidi people. Uh, who are the Yazidis? Uh, Yazidis have a, a, a distinct religion, uh, similar to the, the Shabak religion, but there's no doubt that the Yazidis are not Muslims. Uh, they have often been called devil worshippers, as you can see from the Wikipedia article. Not a fair uh, um, term for their religion at all. Uh, they are sometimes considered to be angel uh, worshippers. Uh, their chief angel is uh, uh, called Melek Taus, the peacock angel. Uh, also called Shaitan, which is the same name uh, in Arabic for Satan. Well, the Yazidis are not Satanists in any real sense. They uh, believe that uh, an archangel of that name once did indeed rebel against God, but uh, later repented and was forgiven and uh, has uh, dominion over earth. For the Yazidis, God is a very distant figure, and it's the angels uh, who count. I think it's very important to understand who the Yazidis are for both current and historical reasons. Historically, I think the most important point is to consider what would happen if Yazidis had lived in Europe in the late medieval or early modern periods. I don't think they would have survived. Uh, yet in what is now northern Iraq, they certainly did survive. There were periods when they were persecuted, but never in any um, genocidal way, at least until uh, 2003 situation has changed and the Yazidis are in a pretty desperate situation uh, right now. Uh, some scholars, uh, particularly of uh, Izadi, uh, whose uh, quote I'll give you here, actually claims that the, the Shabaks with their Yarsan faith, Yazidis, and the Alevis of Turkey are all part of a complex of religions. Now the Alevis in Turkey are a huge group, numbering uh, 10 to 15 million. They're usually considered to be Shiite Muslims. But again, when you look at the Alevi faith, you'll find that it's very far from Orthodox Islam. They don't worship in mosques. They have no problem with alcohol. They believe that the Quran should be taken metaphorically. And many Muslims, uh, especially the uh, Islamists, the more uh, radical Muslims, consider them to be uh, non-Muslim, although they themselves would consider themselves Muslims. Uh, all three of these groups are uh, partake of what has sometimes been called the cult of angels, again. And uh, at the bottom you can see here the uh, belief that's common amongst all these faiths, at least according to Izadi, of seven benevolent divine beings or angels who defend the world from an equal number of malign entities. And there's also a belief in reincarnation uh, throughout these faiths, again showing the uh, less than orthodox nature uh, of all of them. So we've seen a little bit about the beliefs of these people and where they live. Now we've got to put them in geopolitical context. And they happen to live in one of the most geopolitically contested grounds in the world. First, in green on the map, you can see the autonomous region of Kurdistan. This was basically established as a essentially or independent or quasi-independent state after the first Gulf War. Uh, when the United States imposed a no-fly zone, which prevented Saddam Hussein from bombing uh, the Kurds and allowed them to begin building up their own state, or their own autonomous region in these three provinces. The problem is the boundary of those provinces do not correspond with the ethnic boundaries, and since the early period, the Kurds have had control over a broader area, uh, including the area of, of these two bombings, both uh, Kazna and um, uh, at Sinjar in Iraq. So they have been largely under the control of the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish uh, militias. Uh, Kurdish nationalists claim a much broader area, basically everything north of that dark line, which they would like to bring into an autonomous Kurdish region, if not an eventual independent Kurdish state. And they're very much focused uh, uh, on the most important city of Kirkuk, shown there with a red star. But the 
Kirkuk has had a lot of violence, but Mosul has uh, had uh, even more. Uh, the dynamic is such that the Kurds have basically gone to the uh, minority groups, the Yazidis, uh, the Shabaks, and others, and basically said, you can have protection under the Kurdish autonomous region if you join with us, if you vote for our candidates, if you become part of our political process, and some would even go so far as to say if you call yourself uh, Kurds. Not all of these groups have been happy to do this. Uh, actually, it's been quite divisive within several of these communities. Some individuals have been uh, quite willing to join with the Kurdish group. Others have not. Its situations become quite tense after January of 2009 because in Nineveh governorate or province at that time, a Sunni Arab political party came to power. Previously, the Sunni Arabs in the region had boycotted the political process. Uh, once they changed that, they were able to get control of the governorate, uh, which brought them into sharp conflict with the Kurdish uh, autonomous forces and the Kurdish militias, the Peshmerga. This dynamic is what most people think is responsible for the recent spate of violence uh, in the area. Now, if we look at an ethnic map of northern Iraq, the same area, again, this is uh, by uh, M.R. Izadi, Columbia University Gulf 2000 project, actually extraordinarily detailed mapping, you can see some of the complexities of the ethnic geography in this region. Uh, one thing to note is the uh, differentiation of color here. The dark uh, blue are Kurdish uh, areas. The yellow would be Sunni Arab areas. But in between that Kurdish area in the north, the Sunni Arab uh, area uh, to the south and to the west, we see sort of a fracture zone of many different groups. Uh, here we have uh, the Nineveh uh, governorate or province uh, imposed over it. And you can see the northern part of this is a zone of tremendous ethnic diversity and complexity. We have in purple what Izadis calls the, the Yazdanism group. That would be the Yazidis. Uh, it would be the Shabaks, it would be the Yarsan followers, uh, people s mostly speaking Kurdish, although in the case of the Shabaks in the central area, speaking their own language, but with this very heterodox or uh, religious complex. We have other groups here. We have the Turkmen, who speak a Turkish uh, language, very similar to the language spoken in Turkey. Uh, some of them are Sunni, you can see in the Telafar area, Sunni Turkmen. Others are Shiite, those in the Kirkuk area. Uh, the Turkmen tend to identify more by language than by their specific religious sect. They tend to be very much opposed to the Kurds. They are very much afraid that they will become a minority group within a Kurdish-dominated northern Iraq. And so they tend to take on an anti-Kurdish uh, uh, political position, often aligning with the uh, uh, Sunni Arabs, but not always. And then another group we have are the Assyrian Christians, who actually belong to several different Christian um, churches. Uh, Christianity goes back um, at least 1,700 years, if not earlier, in this region. It has been a, a major center of Christianity for a long time. Uh, and the Assyrian Christians are now in scattered groups, as you can see these uh, pinkish areas on the map. At one time, though, the Assyrian Christians were dominant in much of this region. Uh, we've all heard of uh, the uh, Armenian Genocide, or the so-called Armenian Genocide, uh, from the early 1900s and late 1800s. At the same time, the Assyrian Christians were targeted as well. It's estimated that 750,000 were killed uh, between 1914 and 1918. There were later attacks on the Assyrian Christians in the 1930s and many attacks on them since 2003. So they have been uh, victimized as well. At one time, there was a call for an independent Assyrian state in the so-called Assyrian Triangle in the north where they were 100 years ago the dominant population in this region, as we saw uh, from a previous slide, they are now a, um, a minority group here uh, scattered in uh, separate villages. And we can also see how the Assyrian Triangle is wholly within the uh, area that Kurdish nationalists would like to see as a Kurdish uh, autonomous region, if not a Kurdish independent state. A few other things to consider about this region. It's not just the ethnic 
issues that make it problematic, but it's also other geographical issues, uh, such as population. You can see here in this population density map of Iraq that the major concentration of population in the country is from Baghdad uh, down south. But you can see precisely in this zone around Mosul, Kirkuk, uh, what we might call the contested zone between the Kurdish autonomous region and the non-Kurdish areas, pretty significant population concentrations. It's an area where you can uh, where it gets enough rainfall, you can have rain-fed agriculture, you don't need irrigation, and it's uh, long been a cultural center. Uh, perhaps more importantly, it is a huge oil-producing area. Kirkuk is often described as a city floating on a sea of oil, and there are major oil deposits all along this belt just south of the uh, area that the Kurds now have control, or along that contested border. And so, of course, this makes the political fighting very tense uh, in this region. A few other things to consider. One is that many uh, Kurdish nationalists aim for eventually, or would hope for, an independent Kurdistan that would extend well outside of Iraq. You can see Iraqi Kurdistan south of the black line on this map, but far more Kurds live in Turkey than in Iraq. Uh, area that's been uh, had tremendous violence over the last few decades as certain Kurds have fought against the Turkish state and large numbers of Kurds in Iran as well, some in Syria. And actually, if we back up a little bit more, we can see that there are Kurdish populations scattered over a much broader area, uh, even into eastern uh, Iran. The Kurds are sometimes described as the largest nation without a state, or in other words, the largest sort of self-consciously political group with, with political aspirations uh, that doesn't have any sort of uh, political container for those aspirations. And again, if we back up a little bit and look at the broader ethno-religious geography of the area, we can also see another level of complexity. Uh, another map by uh, Mr. Izadi uh, showing in light green Sunni Arab, uh, excuse me, a Sunni religious uh, areas and in the darker green Shiite religious areas. So it's a map of religion. Christians are in red here. Uh, but if one looks at, at northern Iraq here, you can see a lot of diversity. You can see the uh, brown area showing the Yazidis and uh, some red areas for Christians. Uh, looking at the neighboring areas, we might uh, isolate what some people have called a, a heterodox zone a zone including much of eastern Turkey, including the entire Kurdish-speaking area, but also extending down the mountains of Syria into Lebanon, even into northern Israel, where we have groups like the Druze. Are they Muslim? It depends on who you say, who you ask. Uh, the Alawites, again, a group often considered non-Muslim. Uh, they control the state of Syria, but they are uh, very heterodox in their religious uh, beliefs. Uh, Lebanon itself has 18 recognized uh, religious sects, uh, all of which have a political uh, position. Uh, one could probably say that this zone has some of the most complex religious geography in the world. We have religious faiths here that go back uh, many thousands of years that have persisted alongside others that have had cross-fertilization uh, and a variety of uh, different connections uh, over that period. What seems to be happening, though, is uh, attacks on the, the very heterodoxy of this region by a certain uh, radical uh, Islamists, uh, giving rise to a process, well, actually a process that has been going of quite some time of stripping out the diversity of this region. We can look at the uh, genocide or expulsion of uh, Armenian and Assyrian Christians, uh, we can look at the formation of the state of Israel and the subsequent uh, fleeing of Jewish populations from this region. Uh, and then we can go on up to the present day. Now, people who are fleeing out of the violence of northern Iraq are tending to go to uh, Syria or Jordan. So in one sense, they're remaining within this broader heterodox zone. But we do certainly see in Iraq a stripping away of diversity and uh, actually attacks on the very diversity. And just as a, a bit of an aside, this is also a region that has tremendous historical significance. Uh, the Fertile Crescent, the origin of agriculture, is basically in this region. We can see a map showing the distribution of wild barley and wheat, and it's very, very similar to that earlier map I showed of the uh, heterodox zone. 
But the big question is, is, is this really something that might be called genocide? Many scholars would uh, deny uh, that term, would claim that genocide has to be much more of a, of a planned uh, a process of exterminating a group of people, and this may be a little bit more of an anarchic situation, so it may not count as genocide. Uh, certainly, though, it is a cause for concern. Uh, Minority Rights Group report from uh, 2007 on assimilation, exodus, and eradication of Iraq's minority communities shows that since the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, half of Iraq's minority people have fled. Uh, population, uh, according to uh, Taneja here, claims that in 2003, up to 10% of Iraq's population were members of these minority groups. Of the 1.8 million Iraqi refugees uh, in neighboring countries, 30%. Also, there's uh, direct evidence that certain extremist Islamist groups have caused for the total destruction of the Yazidi community, as well as the Mandaeans. The Mandaeans are another minority group I haven't mentioned. Uh, they believe that John the Baptist was the most important prophet and regard both uh, Jesus and Muhammad as false prophets. Uh, quite a distinctive uh, religious sect. They've lived in Iraq um, for several thousand years, uh, and most of their population has either been killed or fled to neighboring countries in the last few years. Uh, Baha'is and other minority group have no rights to citizenship in Iraq at present. So these are issues that many people uh, think deserve uh, more attention. Start looking at websites, uh, you'll certainly find that many Christian groups claim there is a genocide against Christians in northern uh, Iraq. Uh, very easy to find uh, websites, the Syrian International News Agency talking about mounting fears of uh, ethnocide. Uh, genocide against uh, Christians, uh, and well over half of the Christian population has been forced to flee. Uh, Yazidis uh, on their own websites claim they are victims of genocide as well. And you can see here the truth about the Yazidis and uh, a web page bringing up what they refer to as the Yazidi genocide. Uh, Shabbat is a, a more complicated issue. Uh, Seldom has the situation there been described as genocide, but the Wikipedia article does uh, claim that the number of Shabak deaths is approaching genocide levels. If you had 60,000 Shabaks to begin with, 1,000 killed, and that was, I should mention, before the latest bombing attack. Uh, numbers like that certainly could be considered uh, in, the, in the realm of genocide. Uh, get to get back to the political dynamic here, and this is where I'll uh, end the lecture though, we don't really know exactly what is happening with the Shabak people right now. Uh, there are reports that many Shabaks have tried to ally themselves with the Kurds. Now remember their language is not exactly Kurdish, it's related to it, so they are distinct from the Kurds. But many are hoping that by identifying themselves with the Kurds, they can sort of come under the protection of the Kurdish autonomous region, which is the region with the least violence in Iraq. But it's that border zone, that contested area of next to the Kurdish autonomous region, which is the most violent one. So there are many Shabaks evidently who are calling themselves Kurds and wanting to ally with the Kurds. But one can easily find anti-Kurdish views uh, uh, here from a website, uh, one author claiming that the genocide, there is a planned genocide against, against the Shabaks by the Kurdish militias. Uh, and this is a, a website, a uh, very anti-Kurdish view, as I said, which denies there is even such a thing as a Kurdistan or a nation or a group of people called the Kurds. Uh, that seems quite unlikely to me, but then the question is raised, well, who did attack the Shabak village and the Yazidi village. Most likely it would be an e extreme uh, uh, Islamist who are opposed to these people for their uh, non-Islamic practices. Uh, but it's also tied up with this complex multi-part struggle. Perhaps it was something uh, done by uh, uh, more straightforward Sunni Arab forces who want to remove these groups from their connection with the Kurds by showing that the Kurds cannot and will not protect them. 
and there's actually evidence that the new anti-Kurdish uh, government uh, in Nineveh prefecture is trying to uh, make some sort of outreach to the Yazidis, to the Shabaks and others to wean them away from the Kurds. So at least there are allegations that this has uh, been done. And you can see from this website there are even allegations that the Kurdish militias themselves are doing it. That seems quite unlikely to me, but the uncertainty perhaps is the best thing to bring up here. Now, of course, if you go to the Kurdish websites, you'll find a completely different view, a view of Kurdistan as the other Iraq, which is peaceful, uh, and where people get along. And one interview in the other Iraq, uh, we see, uh, uh, for example, someone saying that in Kurdistan you see churches besides mosques. We have Christians and Armenians, we have Yazidis, we have Muslims, we have Jews. Well, not very many Jews, but uh, at least a few. We've shown that all sorts of religions and ethnic groups uh, can get to, uh, can uh, live in the tolerant Kurdish uh, region. Uh, what the actual situation is, of course, is a little bit more difficult to know. Certainly in Kurdistan proper, in the areas that are fully with, under Kurdish control, we can see these high levels of, of, of tolerant peacefulness. But that border zone, on the other hand, anything but. And as the U.S forces uh, continue to pull back and leave Iraq, I think it's quite likely that the violence in that contested zone is going to continue, uh, probably even intensify, and we're going to see the minority peoples caught in between, uh, victimized at a level that perhaps could be called uh, genocidal. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. You've mentioned a couple of times that the violence has increased since 2003, which is, of course, the year that the U.S. went in. And I'm wondering what the U.S.'s role has been in this and, and to what extent our government and our military is aware of the complexity of this situation. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, I would have a hard time answering how much the U.S. military is aware of the complexity. I would think that uh, there are certainly intelligence officers in the military who I would think probably have a pretty good sense of what's going on there. Uh, they certainly, is, it's not something that they're talking about a great deal. Uh, you're absolutely right that 2003 is the key year. Saddam Hussein uh, certainly had a genocidal campaign against the Kurds. Uh, and had many areas where there was quite a bit of ethnic cleansing uh, of the Kurds, Arabization program. But in general, uh, groups that were, minority groups that were not politicized were in general not attacked by Saddam Hussein. So Christians, uh, Yazidi, Shabaks, others generally lived in pretty peaceful uh, conditions. Uh, there was a lot of hope when Saddam Hussein fell among these groups that they that their position would uh, would become even even better they had no idea that they would end up being attacked uh, like this certainly the situation of the Christians the Yazidis the Shabaks and others have, have uh, became orders of magnitude more problematic after uh, the US invasion what I can say is that it seems like there's a real reluctance on the part of the American public to talk about what's going on here because I think it's inconvenient for, for both political sides. It's very inconvenient for the right wing because there's uh, a level of, of culpability here. But certainly uh, George Bush didn't intend to exterminate the Christian population of Iraq, but it looks like that may be one of the uh, results. I think the left is also un un uneasy about talking about this because it shows perhaps a continuing responsibility of the United States to try to uh, sort out this uh, issue and not just uh, let it turn into uh, a, a bloody conflict. And I just don't think we want to um, sort of, sort of uh, recognize uh, the way the situation is. It's, it's just simply too uh, inconvenient. Any other questions? I had a question about the economic geography of this region. You talked about the large oil fields that underlay the contested zone, but are the minority people 
actively employed in any way in those oil fields? Are the oil fields themselves even being developed? Who's getting the revenues? And as a separate but possibly related question, I wondered about the minority people's attitude toward education of women. Uh, yeah, great questions. First, I'll take the oil question. In the federal government of Iraq, there's a complex revenue sharing agreement for these oil of revenues. A certain percentage goes to the central government, and a certain percentage then would go to the uh, to the region. So the Kurdish autonomous region would get revenues out of uh, the oil. Oil is really almost the only economic game in Iraq these days. Uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times uh, this week on agriculture in Iraq and how it has plummeted, uh, in, again, especially since 2003. So oil really is uh, the economic uh, bulwark uh, of the region. There has certainly been development of these oil fields in the north, but not nearly uh, to the extent that they could be because of the security situation. Uh, lying right there in this contested zone and zone of violence makes it very difficult to uh, drill more oil, build the infrastructure and the like. So it's, it's hope that if a peaceful situation develops that there will be uh, much larger exports of oil out of this region. But as I mentioned before, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I m don't know about the employment situation. Most of these Minority groups live in their own distinctive villages. Villages tend to be, uh, many of them, especially on the Nineveh Plain, there is a village either of Assyrian Christians or of Shabax or of others. Uh, and these are mostly uh, agricultural villages. So I would be surprised if there's a tremendous amount of uh, work in the oil fields, but I'm not sure. The other question has to do with education of women. Uh, the Heterodox Muslim groups uh, in this area, well, the Alevis of Turkey are the largest of these groups, are noted for gender egalitarianism, or at least what we might call relative gender uh, egalitarianism. Women have a relatively uh, high position and have relatively high levels of uh, education within them. I'm not sure about uh, the Yazidis, but I would imagine it would be a somewhat uh, similar situation. Uh, you wouldn't have the kind of gender egalitarianism that you would find certainly in uh, Sweden, for example, but it would be uh, a, a much more uh, equal situation than you would find, uh, say, in uh, the Sunni Arab parts of Iraq, uh, and certainly much more than in a, a place like Saudi Arabia. Any other questions? I yes. I have a question. Okay. Uh, what, what does history tell us about similar situations like this? In that, in that, in general, you've got maybe two or three large group: the Sunnis, the Shiites, the Kurds, and then you've got these small ethnic groups that you've described to us. And 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 is it a, a pattern to kind of go in? And it seems to me these smaller ethnic groups kind of complicate things. And that if you're you're really interested in, in the oil fields and controlling the oil fields or the wealth of the area, that from a strategic standpoint, it makes sense to, to clean up the field and kind of get rid of these, these small groups that complicate things. And, and, and neither side, you know, they're, are they Sunnis? Are they Shiites? Are they Kurds? Well, you know, no, there's something else. And so through the course of time, maybe you can, you can, clarify the water by getting rid of some of this, these uh, complicated, smaller issues that, that you can rid yourself of and, and then really focus between the two or the three groups that are really going to struggle in there. Is, is there something similar that, that took place in Africa or, or somewhere else in the world, in, in Asia somewhere, that, that reminds us of this? Yeah, very interesting. That certainly one of the big stories of the modern period, especially the last hundred years, has been a reduction of ethnic diversity. Many small ethnic groups are disappearing all the time. The truly tiny ethnic groups, and we can find uh, many of them in many parts of the world, uh, and uh, many of them simply uh, do go ex extinct. People often will acculturate to larger neighboring groups. 
if you have a dis very distinctive religion, it makes it more difficult to acculturate yourself to a different ethnic group because that tends to differentiate uh, yourself. Uh, if we look at, say, the Balkan Peninsula, or a country like Greece is a good example. Greece, uh, 100 years ago, uh, had uh, very large Muslim populations. It had many non-Greek uh, populations. Most of those groups, uh, Muslim groups in Greece, were basically expelled at the same time the Greeks in Turkey were expelled in the 1920s, and the populations were exchanged. Of course, they had another country to go to. Uh, Albanian groups and Vlach groups and others were forcibly Hellenized, taught to speak Greek in schools and basically sort of been forced to adopt a, a Greek identity. So that is something that national governments have often been uh, keen to do and uh, for um, obvious reasons, but that's also a process that does uh, reduce ethnic diversity and can be considered an assault on, on human uh, uh, freedom as well. Another route to go would be to try to create a broader Iraqi national identity that can subsume within itself ethnic diversity, the sort of a pluralistic national identity. And I think that's what many people are hoping to see uh, in Iraq. But it is certainly not going to be easy at all. Uh, Iraq was essentially created by Winston Churchill, who had never visited the region, along with other British imperial uh, agents taking out maps and getting census data and drawing lines and saying, well, voila, here's the country of Iraq. It was never uh, governed as one region. It was under the Ottoman Empire in earlier periods, and it was governed as several uh, different uh, uh, regions. So Iraq is, in a way, in that sense, is um, you know, a, a constructed country. And there's a lot of hope that eventually that constructed country can construct a common uh, ethnic identity which will allow this kind of linguistic and religious pluralism. We see little sign of that happening right now. And if Iraq uh, is going to survive over the next 20 years, many people think it's going to survive in a much more balkanized fashion with these divisions between uh, Sunni Arab and Shiite Arab and, uh, and, and Kurdish uh, areas. Will these minority groups be able to find security uh, within, uh, within that sort of Iraq? Well, we'll see. I'm not very optimistic. Thank you all for the uh, questions. Um, delighted to be able to give this lecture. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.